Good afternoon to all of you who are joining us today for yet another exciting virtual career talk. Uh, today we have the great pleasure and honor to have a trustee of the Vizela Foundation, Dr. Ibrahim Badejo, who is based um, in Cambridge, Massachusetts in the US, and he is connecting to share his life story and also some career and educational tips with you. Before I give him the floor, I wanna read a little bit of his background so you understand the gravitas that we have present <laughs> with us, uh, this afternoon. So he is Senior Director of New Ventures at Johnson & Johnson, uh, the Innovation Center in Boston. He leverages his expertise in smart materials and biomaterials to support the medical device sector. From 2010 to 2013, um, he was research fellow at Global Surgery Group of Johnson & Johnson, where he was responsible for external and front-end innovations and in intellectual property for Ethicon Biosurgery. From 2006 to 2010, he was the director of applied research and new technology assessment of novel biomaterials. Prior to that, he was the chief scientist of Closure Medical Group, which was acquired by Johnson & Johnson in 2005. Um, he had also previously held various positions at Bayer, North Carolina State University, uh, the College of Charleston, and he currently also serves in his, as an adjunct professor of biomedical engineering at Drexel University. During his career, Dr. Badejo has last led teams in the development of commercialized biomaterials-based products and new technology products that are licensed or have been acquired. He received his Bachelor of Arts degree in chemistry from Avila University. He also received his PhD in organic chemistry from the University of Toledo, where he was the Robert White Ford Memorial Scholar for Outstanding Graduate Research and a Petroleum Research um, Fund Fellow. He is also the recipient of 24 U.S. patents with others uh, pending. So in addition to everything that I've just described, he's also an inventor and an innovator, and he has 24 patents. As they say in Nigeria, it is not beans. So can you please <laughs> give a very warm welcome to Dr. Ibrahim Badejo. Ivy, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Uh glad for the invitation to present you know it's been it's been a pleasure honestly and i'm humbled to also serve uh, on your foundation and i am really thrilled about what you are doing to really you know galvanize and really help a uh, woman you know to just uh, grow because i believe every one of us every human being is endowed with knowledge female male are equally gifted to have an impact in our world. So, you know, great job that you're doing. And I think, uh, you know, this, um, the women you're touching, you know, some men are also on this call, but I think there's every one of them, as I tell my son, you're gifted. There's so much potential in you. Go out and live it out. And that's what I'm gonna start my conversation with, that every one of you on this call, you are gifted, and I want to encourage you to live it out to the full potential to what is being in you because no one is going to do that for you. You have to do that for yourself. But I have no doubt that you are going to do it well. So today I'm going to talk about, you know, so I'm humbled to be part of this conversation about career discussion. But really I want to talk about, you know, a little bit about my life, my beginning, and how fate has brought me to where I am today. So my talk today is actually going to focus on key areas. I'm going to talk about my life compass. What drives me? What, who, who, who is, you know, when I wake up every day, what really drives me? And I'm going to talk about my life in Nigeria. I've, you know, I was born in Ijebu, Ijebu Ife. Then I talk about my life and career in the U.S. And I have been very fortunate to have been, uh, to have this opportunity to have, uh, you know, grow up in Nigeria you know, even in the midst of lack of resources. My slide, I'll share my screen. Um, 
שאני... I don't want this to be a monologue. Is that okay? Because I don't think you just want to hear me. I want to hear you too. And please uh, interrupt me with questions. And uh, as a college professor, um, I like dialogue. And so this is not just something that I'm just going to be telling, you know, share. But I want you to, you know, interrupt, interject, you know, ask me questions. So this is, a, you know, a conversation. So. This is me. Um, you see uh, some guy that looks uh, innocent. This was actually my, uh, I went to school in, you know, I went to my own, uh, high school in Federal Government College of the Gulu. Now that was, this is me, 1981, just before I came to the US. And this, was, this is me last year. And this picture was recently taken in 2020. So you've seen uh, me as uh, young, I didn't even have a beard then, you know, to an old guy, but I'm still kicking, you know, so I, I continue to, um, but I haven't really changed if I look at myself, except I look a little bit innocent when I was, uh, you know, when I was in high school in Nigeria, so. So I, so I said, I talk about my life compass, talk about my life in Nigeria, talk about my life and career in the US, and then, you know, I open up for question and answer. But that being said, I don't want to, um, want to have be a monologue for me just to talk, but I want to hear from you too. Can you guys hear me? Just do like this if you can hear me. Good. So what's, what drives me? You know, there are four areas of my life that are key, important to me. First is my spirituality. It's important to me. Family is also very important to me. You know, I, you know, I am blessed with a son and the time that I spend with him is, is, is important. Um, healthcare is what keeps me, and I'm gonna share some of the uh, innovations that I've been very fortunate to, to have really bring into being. Another area that's really important to me is leveraging my gift for humanity. Um, I have been very fortunate to have served in different parts of the world. You know, I've led missions. And I can see, it's not, I know that when I, you know, finish my academic career, you know, I'm going to devote the rest of my life in bullet four to really, you know, spend 100% of my time. I do give back right now, but I want to give back more. And the fifth, you know, part of, what drives me is education. And it's like this conversation we're having. I just, you know, I want to learn from young people. But also too, I have made it really a mission of myself. When I get an email from a student or from someone that's early in their career that they just want to talk to me, you know, I take it because I want to learn from them as well as I want to share some of uh, learning throughout my you know, close to 30 years of uh, industrial experience. So these are five, if nothing fits these five, you know, of course, you know, I exercise, you know, that's, you know, my health and all that I exercise. So, but if nothing fits these five, I just really, you know, drops down because we are, I only have 24 hours in the day. In that 24 hours, I have to sleep and stuff like that. So, you know, it's important for me to, you know, have a time you know, I'm a believer and I, 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 I don't shy away from telling everyone I'm a Christian. You know, I, you know it's, it's important for me to spend time in the morning and before I go to bed. Family is important to me. Innovation in healthcare is important to me. And even then too, disparity in healthcare innovation is important to me. The reason I said that I come to Africa, you know, last, last year, yes, I was in the University of Ibadan, um, teaching hospital, giving a talk on innovation, get, looking at how we can help impact healthcare. This year, we started um, Amoke Foundation. Why is that important? My late wife died of sickle cell crisis. And it's, heart, you know, it's heartbreaking to see that people are still dying at this age. So we started our Amoke Foundation at UCH to try to see what we can do at UCH to lower the burden of mortality associated with sickle cell. 
And as I said, my gift to, huma gift to humanity and education are key. So this is what drives me. No, so let's talk about my life in Nigeria. I was born in Nigeria. I was, you know, actually to be candid, I was actually born in Ghana. You know, so 1970, my parents, you know, we were part of the Ghana, you know, before Ghana must go, you know, we did the same thing to Ghanaians. So Bushra came to power and asked all Nigerians to move out of Ghana. And so in 1970, I came to Nigeria, could barely speak any Yoruba. So I went to a school in, in Lagos called SCC in Fadeyi. And we lived in Shomolu, or it's outside Pangroove. And we walk every day from Pangroove to Fadeyi. And when I tell my nieces and nephew that we, we walk, they, they can believe it. We walk every day to school. It was then that I think Folks recognize that I have this appetite for science. I remembered coming home with a big book that I was given an award in school for being the best science student. I think I was in class three. No, no, I think it was primary three or primary four. I was given an award and my sister still reminds me of that award that it was a book with different types of animals and, you know, so, so there's, it's been, it's been part of me to be a scientist since I was young or, you know, there's, there's, and I've always enjoyed to enjoy science. So life in Nigeria, that's me and my mom. I come to Nigeria quite often actually, uh, until this COVID, well, actually this year, I've been to Nigeria twice. Now I'm in Nigeria about twice, three times a year. My mom is now 86. So I make an effort because she's alive, she's a Muslim, and I'm just sharing this with you. The reason I go to Nigeria a lot is that I know by the time I get a phone call that you know, she's, she's passed, they will have buried her before I get home. Because that's where the Muslim bury, you know, they bury within 24 hours. So I spend time to visit my mom as of, so she is important to me. So when I go to my town, I go to Jebuife, and I am a homeboy you know, walking around and go to the market and, you know, buy suya and just, you know, just hang out there and I enjoy my time there. So I went to high school, elementary school in Lagos, went to high school in Federal Government College of Dubulu. Interestingly too, is that I'd been on scholarship, even from high school. I won a scholarship to attend my high school at Federal Government College of Dubulu. And I was, um, so anyway, I, I won a good state scholarship then. Um, that's my, me and my twin brother. I'm a twin. And this uh, picture here and the lower half here. So, um, and this my, is this, uh, this my dad in the Toban. He's a Seriki of Ijebufe. But he, you know, he was the same care of the job, but he he since passed. So, but that was one of you know the celebration. And so there are quite a few folks here, uh, you know, family members, you know, my so I'm also close to my dad. I remembered one day I was talking to my dad, and then my dad asked me, you know, uh, they, my nickname when I was young is called Old Man. And uh, you know, the reason I was given that is you know, I was told that I, since I was young, I've always had this serious look in my face. That I was, you know, it's almost like I'm always pontifying or thinking. So since I was little, so they called me old man. So even up to today, you know, if you, if you ask for Taiwo, they will ask who is that? If you ask for Ibrahim, they wouldn't know who to talk to. But if you say old man, they know who to, you're talking about. So my dad asked me one day, old man, you know, I think maybe when I was 15, 16, 15 probably, he said, old man, what, what do you want to be? So well, I wanted to be a soldier. And the reason was, I had an uncle. He, he actually just recently passed, or cousin. He recently passed. He was doing well, and he is a land soldier. And he became a role model. 
and as fate will have it, when I was, you know, when I was in high school, it was only a five year program. So um, now I think it's six years. Then it was five year program. In class three, you choose your subjects. So I chose English, language, mathematics, ad maths, geography, history, economics, physics, chemistry, biology, and history. Oh, by the way, too, I taught my class when I finished. When I finished high school, I taught my class. And I was, then they always, they have what is called grade one, grade, grade one distinction, grade one, grade two, grade three. I missed grade one distinction by one point. So when they added all my scores together, if you have, you know, then they will choose your best six subjects and they will add, they, they will add you know, they, they call the aggregates. You know, A1 is one point, A2 is two point, you know, F9 is nine points. So they add all that, they will add all the best six subject aggregates. And if they come between six and 12, you have grade, grade one distinction. If they come between 12 and 24, you have grade one. If they come between 25 and 32, you have grade two. If they come between 30 to 48, you have grade three. Anything beyond that, you have F. I scored, when they counted my best six, I scored 13. So I missed grade one distinction by one point. So my dad asked me, what do you want to be when you grow up? When, what, what do you want to go for university for? I said, well, dad, I want to be a, a land soldier. My dad said, mm, you should be a doctor. You know, as we all know, I don't know about this generation. You know, when, in my generation, whatever your parents tell you you're going to be, you know, <laughs> you don't argue with it, you know. It's, you know so they told me you're gonna be a medical doctor. I said, fine. So, so I finished my uh, uh, undergraduate, I mean, high school in federal government college of the good. Then I proceed to do A-levels at the same institution. So when I finished my A-levels, um, during my A-levels, I had to meet a lot of, then we used to have a lot of Indians in our schools. And one of the Indians literally took me under his wing and mentored me. He was a physics teacher. During that A-levels, I did chemistry, physics, chemistry, and biology because I wanted to go to med school. And I chose several universities, all of them, Northern Nigeria. I chose Amadi Bello University, University of Maiduguri, and Adubairo. There's a reason for that. I, there's no need, I'm not gonna to spend too much time to talk about that. Despite the fact that I did very well, and that is certain about, you know, we talk about racism in Nigeria, in the US, there's still ethnicity in Nigeria that I think we need to try to break through. For X, Y, Z reason, despite the fact that I did very well in my A-levels, I could not get into any medical school in, in the North. Yes, as faith, as faith will have it. So I had one year off and you know, I, my parents were not that rich. And they were, well, they were kind of, non, they were, you know, they only had elementary education. So they, uh, you know, they are okay. I mean, but they, are not, they were not connected. You, you understand what I'm saying? You know, so they can't pick up a phone call and say, okay, you know, Professor XYZ, my son needs an admission. So we literally have to work hard for ourselves. My dad always told me that the only thing I can give you is your education as your inheritance. So I've always worked hard and I think that is, is been part of me till today. And at times, when I think about my son, it's quite opposite. You literally have to feed him everything. You know, and, and I'm asking myself, is this the American that is changing you? Or, you know, your dad is not like this. I mean, you see me in the, in the office by seven o'clock. But it's quite different. 
So my dad was not connected. So as well as I did in A levels, I had a one year that I was, you know, in, during that period, you only you have one shot of the admission. You go to jam and you apply, you know, you choose your university. If you don't get in, you're out. So I year, had one year off from 1970, 1980 to 1981. During that one year, they announced scholarships, you know, and I, I read it in the newspaper and I applied for it. It was the Federal Government Scholarship. No, no, it was Open State Scholarship. And I was the recipient of an Open State Scholarship to come to the US. So that's how I came to the US. I have to be honest with you, I have been very, very fortunate. Um, my parents didn't have to pay for my high school education, didn't have to pay for my college education. So I came to the US on a good state scholarship to, go to, to do pre-med. So that's how my life in the US and career started. So I went to Avila University on a scholarship from Ogun State. And when I, was doing, when I was taking organic chemistry in my sophomore year, as you can see, I also finished my undergraduate in three years. Undergraduate in the US is four year program. I finished it in three years. And there's a reason, you might want to ask me, why do you know, there's a reason for that. First, even though I had a Ogun State scholarship, the money wasn't forthcoming as it should be. It will come, and, but it's always late. So I took on a, a janitorial job. In the university, the same university I, that I was uh, doing my undergraduate, I took a janitorial job. But one thing I made sure was that I made sure I was taking the full cost load, which was 18 hours, 18 credit hours. Because whether you take 12 out credit hours or you take 18 credit hours, because you're paying tuition, it doesn't matter. So I was taking 18 full credit. And summer, I'll go to summer school, take full credit for the summer school, which is nine credit hours. So combining all that, I was able to finish my undergraduate in three years. And I was also very fortunate to have you know, graduate around 3.7, 3.8 GPA. But key here, and I'm gonna, you're gonna see, you see some pictures here. So I, I, I received my undergraduate in 1984. The same school that I used to be a janitor, I am currently mm -hmm. governor You're speaking now. Mm -hmm. the school. The same school that I used to be a janitor, I am on the board of governors of that school. In 2015, I was given the Science Alumni Award. This is the same school that I used to clean the bathroom. Now, what is key here? There's a, a lady here, Sister Marie Joan Harris. So every year I go to the school graduation because the governor, board of governors have to come, we have to dress in the robe and you know, give diplomas and, you know, clap and give, so I was, this is one of the pictures I took maybe about a year or two ago. With Sister Marie, I was very poor when I was finishing. And I really felt that I can't, you know, oh, by the way, before then I changed from being a premier to chemistry because I was influenced by Dr. Jim Andrade. He just mesmerized me by how he taught organic chemistry. And I said, yes. I want to be a teacher too. What I'm trying to say here is that in our lives, there are people that have influence on us. And it's important for every one of us to always find a mentor that will always guide us. No matter how smart we are, no matter how knowledgeable we think we are, find someone that have, you know, blaze the trail that you can learn from. So I really enjoy how Dr. Andre taught chemistry. So I changed my major from pre-med 
to chemistry. And my dad could never have it. I called him one day and said, Dad, I'm not going to medical school. I'm going to graduate school for chemistry. He said, what? We all thought you were going to be the only doctor in our family. It was a big disappointment for my dad. But I'm sure fast forward, knowing what I've done since then, you know, before he passed, I'm sure he, you know, that was no longer an issue for, for him. But anyway, Sister Marie was also one of my men mentors. And I remembered going to Sister Maria just by the time I was about to graduate, telling her that you know, I'm really cannot afford to go to graduate school. I don't have money. You know, I just want to go get a teaching job as a you know, high school teacher and taught chemistry. Sister Marie closed the door, my you know, said, Eve, they call me Eve in the US, say, Eve, you and I need to have a, a talk. So, so she said, well, you can do it. Don't settle for less. Don't focus on today. Think about the future. I know it's tough for you financially. I mean, then, you know, I probably was making, you know, I was making $300 a week, a month. So, you know, calculate that, that's, you know, 3,600, 3, you know, times 12. 3,600, you know, to me it was, it was dirt poor. I'm being sincere with you. I used to remember, I used, you know, my lunch to school is egg in a sandwich bread. That's my lunch every day. Because I have to pay rent in this $300 that I'm getting every month. But one thing she told me up to the, you know, think of the future. Don't think about, you know, because then I could have finished and, you know, got a job making $20,000 $20, a month, a year, which from $3,600 to $20,000, to me, was a big jump. I mean, and that's what I was thinking. I was short-sighted in my thinking. She told me, no, I think you can do it. And she suggested I go to graduate school. She suggested I apply. And I was quite surprised. I was applying and I was getting an assistantship and fellowship. I said, wow, that was easy. But again, if I wasn't mentored by her, if she didn't have a heart-to-heart -heart talk with me. So in our career, in our lives, you know, we need to have few individuals that are going to be you know, candid with us. So other pictures in this, also a picture of, you know, um, in my trust, I've less on that trust. If something ever happened to me, I've like also get an endowment. And that was a write up of, of, of me on the school uh, annual brochure of a kid that came to the school that used to mow lawn, went on to now being an entrepreneur and innovator. So, Avila, and I'm grateful to for Sister Marie for having that heart to heart talk with me. We have a mentor, you should always have a mentor. A mentor is someone that you can, you should always have a mentor. A mentor is someone that you can be vulnerable and open with, and can always give you guidance. Of course, at the end of the day, it's left to you to, to, you know, to accept it, to follow through it. But at least, you know, someone that you can be candid with, and as I said, you know, vulnerable with. I still, whenever I'm about to make any major career decisions, I'll still, you know, just bounce it off Sister Marie. So Sister Marie, what do you think? So, well, you know, she will give me her, you know, opinion, but at the end of the day, I'll make that final call. So, went on to get a PhD at the University of Toledo. And I can tell you that the PhD wasn't easy either. Literally, I almost dropped out. I almost dropped out. When I was finished my undergraduate, people thought I was, you know, 
smart and all that. And I always make a joke. I had a girlfriend that was living about two hours away and I thought I was that smart too. So every weekend I would just drive to visit with her and until my first semester grade came out. And I was on the verge of being, you know, kicked out of graduate school. And I woke up. So at times it's good to have failures in life because that wakes you up. Because for me, until I took one class and I got, you know, getting a D in graduate school, it's almost getting an F. Graduate school, your grades should be A or B. And I got a D. And I was put on probation. To come back, if I was kicked out and I have to go come to Nigeria, you know, then I had a, in the F1 visa. So you get kicked out. Either you're gonna you know, go out of status or you can go back to Nigeria. That's a shame I didn't want to bring to my family. But as I say again, in our times, failure wakes us up. That woke me up. So by the time I finish, there was a different me. I received so many, so many awards. You know, I became a Robert Y, you know, Petroleum Research Fund Fellow. And when I finished my PhD, I was given the Outstanding Graduate Research Award because I had published about 12 papers by the time I finished my PhD. And that honestly, you know, my professors always said that's, you know, rare. This year I was in finished, you know, I took on a, a faculty job at uh, North Carolina State University as an assistant professor. And that was a short lived career. I still enjoy teaching. But I, you know, I did this for one year and I said, Oh, you know, Taiwo, this is not called, this is not your calling. You might have thought it was your calling. But you know, I quickly re realized that I didn't have the patience. You know, I have a high expectation of me. And I, in part, I was expecting many of the students or all the students to have those high expectations and literally frustrated me. So after one year of teaching at the university, I decided that that was not my, you know, calling, as you want to put it. So I shifted to go to the industry. So, so before I talk about my career in the industry, because one thing that's also important is that uh, when I joined uh, Bayer, um, and I'm just gonna be you know, truthful and honest with you, there were about five recent PhD hires, which I was one of them. My colleagues from, you know, I went to the University of Toledo, it's not in the top 20 universities, you know. You know it's, it's, it's a great, I mean, to me, it's a, it's a great school, but it's not in the top 20, it's not in Harvard, it's not Yale, it's not, you know. The students that were, that, you know, the recent hires were from Stanford, Georgia Tech, one from, one, one from, was from MIT, another one was from Berkeley, and I was the one. Guess who was first promoted among the list of these, you know, top tier, who can answer who was first promoted? Well, if you don't want, you know, you are mute. I was the, the first person. The brilliant, the brilliant student from uh, Avila. Yeah, so I was. But there was something that I think uh, that became part of me when I joined the industries, entrepreneurship and innovation. So I'm going to take a step back. You know, to talk about that. 
you know, what is innovation? What's entrepreneurship? Is that okay? Because it's important, that's part of me. So um, let's start with a question. So today I'm gonna to talk about innovation, invention, I mean, idea, invention, and innovation. But there's a distinction between all these three. There's a distinction, people don't understand that. And there's actually a distinction between invention and innovation. When someone say, I have an idea, what does this mean? I know we're all on mute. So when someone say, I have an idea, you know, all of us, I hope so, we should always have an idea. And, you know, it's, I, I, I use this picture, you know, hmm. You know, it's a thought, a plan, a suggestion about what to do. Something you can imagine in your mind, a picture in your heart. There's nothing wrong with having an idea. But the translation of the idea is, is also important. It's very important. You know, we are known in our culture to have so many great ideas. Please forgive me. I always say you can you can't argue with a Nigerian. You know, <laughs> they are very argumentative. They they always have a point. They have an idea. They have you know. But what do we do with those ideas? A key. So please, if you have an idea, and I always encourage. I tell my son all the time. If you have an idea, write it down. Think about it. That's what the process of invention, innovation, starts from. If you have it. Take it to the next level. If you take, have the idea and then you, 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 you really, you know, create something new out of it that does not previously exist, that's new. You have an invention. You know, I saw a, gen I saw a gentleman wearing a heart. You know, he said, yeah. You might be thinking, well, what can I do with this half art? You know, can I, uh, you know, make it a, have a, you know, someone came up with the idea, you know, a hat with a, a, a flap to cover your hair in the winter. The idea to that now, to something that you can put to cover your hair in, in the winter, is now an invention. Now, when that invention, when you now reproduce it and you can see it in your hand and then people are buying it and it's impacting life, that's innovation. So, it's good to have an idea. It's good, it's good to have invention. And there are many inventions that doesn't go anywhere. But if the invention becomes a commercializable key here, or use of invention or change to an existing that add value, you now become an innovator. So innovative entrepreneurs are essentially problem solver. They look around us, they think about it. They say, oh, this, 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 I have an idea that can solve this problem. They put it together, either in writing, and they literally now convert it to a product or to something that people are benefiting from it. That is an innovation. Where entrepreneurs are looking to always solve problems. I gave this talk in UCH last year, you know, you know just kind of challenging. Uh, this I, it was to the young physicians, you know, to, to really challenge what's in, in innovation. How do you take your idea and make an innovative, develop an innovative solution and really have an impact on humanity? We should always, we should always, we should always, we should always think about that.
let's, you know, may, some of you may see, you know, uh, I may have an idea what I'm trying to say here. Here's a telephone. Many of you, you know, some of you that are young may not have an idea what this was before. You know, that was a telephone on my, on my you know, on my left hand. And then instead of having a cord, someone thought about, why don't I have a cordless phone? In other words, a phone that you don't, you know, when, I, when we used to have a telephone, you used to literally carry this big box around when you're talking. And then it became, you know, you can put, you have a, you know, a base and you can just take a phone. And then when the internet came into being, the first uh, you know, cell phone is what's in this black. And then it goes to this new phone. And then this phone, and then currently, you know, iPhone or some, you know. So what you see in here is that these are examples of innovation that gradually improve, but also deliver capability. I always tell folks that the, um, the uh, computing capability on this small iPhone is many times bigger than my first computer that I paid $4,000 for. My first computer only have 170 megabytes and I paid $4,000 for it. Phones now have, you know, this, some of these phones, you know, you can have 64 gigabytes, you know, it's, you know, <laughs> thousands of more computing capability. You've seen an innovation that's improving the quality of our lives giving us to leverage and you know improving how we talk how we you know leverage technology and that is an example of innovation i am sure that um, steve jobs when he was thinking about the iphone iphone did not come to his mind first came up with this mac then came up with this ipod and it was gradual and people will pay, people are willing to pay $800 for, you know, my son just bought iPhone 12 and I said, paid almost $900 for it. People are willing to pay for innovation. And there's nothing wrong to be rich. But always making sure that you impact life with your innovation and entrepreneurial spirit. So, I was just going to, you know, show you a, a list of my uh, inventions. But uh, can you see this slide? So, um, Ms. Lade uh, talked about uh, Mrs. Lade and about talked about uh, that I have a twenty-four U.S. patent. But globally, I just did a search on it globally because. Once you file a patent in the US, if your company thinks that that patent is very valuable, they file in many countries in the world so that it can be protected. The last time I did this search, just gonna take it to, it gave me 404 results. In other words, my inventions that I've been blessed with are in about 400, you know, replicates. And some of them are same, you know, same invention that was filed here that I was awarded US patent. Canada will also award me Canadian patent. It will go to Europe. Europe will also award me a, your patent. Is that okay? It's only covered. It's only protected in the country where the invention is kept, is in, invented. But if, you're con if, if the company you work for think that the patent is valuable, they'll protect it globally. So what we do at Johnson & Johnson, we identify seven or eight key markets, we call them, and then make sure we protect those inventions there. So the last time I did, I just realized, I don't do this often, I mean, I rarely do it. I just looked at it and, you know, this, my 24 patents has been protected totally, about 404 everywhere. So if you go, if, you know, someone in China cannot reproduce. Oh, by the way, when you have a patent, you are given an exclusive, right to practice that art for 22 years. So no one else can 
you know, to, you know, sell the same product. Of course, you know, people can, you know, develop a knockoff. But if you do that, what, there's what's called patent infringement. And many organizations can come after you. So, um, let me sh also share some of the inventions that I've been very fortunate. Oh, before I go there, I will say, you know, every day, oh, sorry, let me. Here's me. Every day I am hustling. And I really mean it. I mean it in a good sense, in the sense that every day I'm looking for what, what's the new innovation out there? What is gonna be the next disruptive? I wanna be the first person to, to get to talk to that person. So every day I'm hustling. I'm hustling to engage with entrepreneurs. I'm hustling to engage with you know, innovators. I'm hustling to, to find out what is the next you know, uh, invention out there. So, that's just me. So I'm a hustler in a good sense. So I want to talk about uh, my experience as a small company. You know, I was very fortunate to join Closure Medical. So um, I happened to have been very fortunate when I met my wife, you know, she, I was working at Bayer. I was having a great career there. And uh, she was a physician. She was going to do a residence in Chapel Hill. We we're going to do this long distance commute. I was going to be in South Carolina. She was going to be doing Chapel Hill. And we did that for a few months, you know. Um, and she, you know, she was a sickler. She got sick so often. And I just couldn't really stand it anymore. So I decided I was going to join her. So I was looking for a job. So I found, you know, I used to work for Bayer, a big company. Then there was a small startup company called Closure Medical. They were looking for someone with a, a material science background. There were only 10 people in that company then. And I was petrified. I remember going for the interview and they showed me the, 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 the whole lab. The whole lab is not bigger than my, my bedroom. And I, I was scratching my head. So are you sure this is a company? And, you know, I remember EMC telling me that, you know, honey, you know, if we have, to, we have to make sacrifices. And I said, sure. And looking back, it was the best career move. I joined this company, 10 employees. And I became the chief scientist of the company. And we ended up selling the company for $340 million to Johnson & Johnson. But the good thing about this company is, was that, you know, I joined as the company was growing and I was delivering and I was, you know, making an impact. I was being promoted as the company was growing. So it's important to recognize what are the, what are, what are the deliverables and to focus on those deliverables. And what's also important when you work for a small company, and I'm sure you've been in small, you know, you can't hide. So I worked for Closure Medical from 1998 to 2005. And 2005, Johnson & Johnson bought Closure Medical. Um, and then the rest was history. I uh, joined Johnson & Johnson in 2005. I became a research fellow, front-end innovation. I had different roles. And in 2013, I moved to the Innovation Center in Boston, where I became a new venture leader, where I was focusing on investing in the early stage. I bring that perspective because Jan, Jan recognized that I've been part of a small company that had a successful exit. I have learned from what it takes to have a successful exit, to be able to take ideas that are still morphed and tried to really shape it to something that could be um, quite impactful. So again, every day I'm hustling. 
I'm looking for innovation. I'm engaging with the entrepreneurs. And I'm trying to find what is the next breakthrough that Johnson & Johnson should invest their money. And I'll share a few examples of what those inventions that I have been part of, that I've already invested in, that are now commercialized. This is one of my inventions. And um, you might, I'm sure many of you have heard about crazy glue. If you put crazy glue in between your fingers, you better be careful. You won't be, you're not gonna be able to open it. If you try to open, you might rip the skin off. Out of that, we decided to change the chemistry. Please don't use crazy glue to, to close wounds. To come up with a higher homolog of it. And when we came up with the higher homolog, we, called, we launched a product called Dermabond. So instead of, instead of suturing wounds, when someone do, you know, go through a big operation, you can just glue this wound together. And the beauty is that instead of, when you suture a wound, you can take a shower. You have to go back to the physician to have the suture removed. If you glue the wound, you can come home and take a shower immediately. You don't have to go to a physician to have it removed because at 17 to 14 days, the glue itself will slough off. I wasn't the innovator for this first product, but there was something that caught my attention. And I'm gonna talk about my innovation here because this, the US patent 8153 is my invention. Let me see what's the pediatrician. When a kid has a laceration, you know, I'm sure, you know, kids are, they hate needles. Because if you have to suture, you have to use the needle to go through the wound. And she came on the honey, I can't open your arm. Demo bone is so hard. We had a glass ampule. And she, you know, Yemsu was a very petite woman. She didn't have the strength to crush the glass ampule. So if she was having the complaint, I knew that there are many clinicians that are also having that problem. To solve that problem, oh, there was another problem that she was also encountering. One day she came, she come, honey, honey, I just glue, I just could glue someone's eyes together because the glue was running. So it hit me. So we need to improve on the viscosity of the glue. It hit me that we need to change the way we, we break the ampule. That's how this innovation came into being, this last one. So instead of a clinician having to crush the ampule, we put it in a different sleeve. All they have to do is just bend the sleeve and the glass crash. Instead of, if you put it, if you turn it upside down, instead of the glue just running like crazy, like water, the glue is now almost like honey now, just comes out. That's another innovation. So we saw a problem. We addressed it by new invention. This product is now called Dermabone Advanced and it's doing well. It's about 200 million in the market right now. There's another product I'd like to talk to you about. Let me also go to the, so this, this is innovation. Um, um, I, I don't wanna rush you, but uh, well, we wanna give the students an opportunity to also ask questions. So maybe sure. five more minutes and then we can have them. Absolutely, ask. yeah, I think I'm pretty much wrapping up. So, so one, uh, I'm sure we've seen a lot of uh, bike accident in Nigeria, you know, uh, Okada, and many cases, they may, the, the leg may lead to amputation or total disfiguring, or some may even have a leg cancer. 
Right now, they have to amputate that segment of the leg. I was able to identify an innovation at the University of Michigan so that you can 3D print a scaffold, you know, take the MRI and 3D print a scaffold, absorb a scaffold, and implant the scaffold in between those two legs. Those, both, you know, the segment of the leg that you say that, you know, let's say on, you know, you, you have a, an accident, and instead of amputating that segment of the leg, they take that segment of the bone that is crushed. You 3D print a scaffold, you put it in between that segment, and the bone regenerates around that. And we just launched this product this year. This came from an investment that I did out of the University of Michigan. So again, every day I'm hustling. This is me um, giving a talk at uh, Rwanda. And this is another picture that I have with uh, Kigami and uh, um, president of Senegal in one of the conferences that we attended in Rwanda to talk about innovation and entrepreneurship in Africa. I'm gonna close this up by you know, talking about what are the behaviors of innovators. Innovators have to always constantly question. They also have to constantly observe. They also have to always constantly experiment. It's important to network. There is no one innovator that's able to do it all alone. You have to be able to work as a team. Thank you. Any question? Wow. Sorry. Thank, thank you so much. This, this has been so inspiring and you know, I, I have even more admiration and respect for you. I was just Googling your patents just to see some of the things you've invented. Um, I wish I had known that. I should have been thinking about inventing things, but maybe it's not too late for me. It's, not, it's never too late, yeah. yeah. Be, before I hand it over to um, Serena, who's going to facilitate the questions, I, I want to kick off with one question. So something that you said, which is really important, is you know having a mentor. Now, uh, I don't really think that in Nigeria we have that culture necessarily where you can identify somebody professionally, you can, you know, speak to them openly, um, they can, you know, give you real career advice, you can bounce ideas off of them. And I think sometimes girls are also uh, limited because of just the culture and how they're raised. So what are some tips uh, for these students um, to, to know how to identify a mentor, to approach this mentor? And mentorship is not a one-way street. There has no. to be a take. So um, they shouldn't see a mentor as somebody you know, that they will always go and take from. They should also be able to add value. So maybe if you can kick us off by just telling them some tips on what they can do to develop uh, and cultivate relationships with mentors who can help them uh, in their academic, but also in their professional lives. And then Serena, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. That's a good question. Um, for me, one, one thing I appreciate you know, um, is, uh, is someone that you're first, you know, you have, you have to look, you know, in, in, for me, I have to look up to them. That, you know, they've achieved something that, I, you know, is inspiring to me. And uh, I have to be, op you know, be open with them and say, look, you know, um, Mr. So so so, or Mrs. So so and so, um, uh, I'd like for you to guide, to, you know, be, be vulnerable. You know, I, I want to, you know, guide, you know, I want you to be able to guide me and I have, I'm, you know, and I, I want to be able to, you know, have some, if I have some questions, can I, you know, bounce off you and, you know, but it, it starts as a relationship. And the relationship, as uh, you know, Mrs. Saraba said, you know, it's, uh, it's something that it's a two-way street. And it's a two-way in the sense that, you know, I always want to learn from young people, you know, uh, because they are tech, they are more tech savvy than I am. <laughs> and so my son, you know, is, uh, I, I always say, son, can you help me with this? Uh, yes, I can. You know, so how do you, we all have to ask, how, what also can you give back to the individual? And, but also to just be mindful of their time. This is not just a, a chit chat talk. You know, when you go there, be prepared. 
to have a good conversation, you know. Um, and it's like me, before I go to meet with my boss, I always have a, I have a notepad, I have a list of things that I'm going to really talk about because I only have 30 minutes, hit it, you know. So you have to come prepared. And by the same token, when you're talking with a mentor, always, you know, when you share something, take a pause. You know, don't barrage them, you know. Just take a pause and, you know, get a feedback or respond. And also to say, you know, always go there with a notepad. It's simple, honestly. You know, I, I struggled with my son. You talk to him or the teacher is talking, he doesn't even have a notepad writing something on. And I said, son, come on, you know. They have to feel that they're also, you know, impacting what in your life. If you come there with it unprepared and, you know, you closing the statement that you say, okay, you, know, uh, you it might be your uncle, cousin, whatever, you know, this is what you said, you know, you know, next time when I come back, I like to give you feedback on what I've done towards those actions. So that they feel that whatever you guys are talking about is, you, you know, something that you're going to make it an actionable as opposed to just a conversation. So I hope right. you answered that question, you know. But it's important that the person, you're, it's important, it's key that you, you, you must be comfortable with the individual because you're going to have to be vulnerable so that they can really you know, help you out. Thank you very much, Mr. Davidjo, for your, for this wonderful presentation. Thank so we'll go straight to the questions. I'm Melinda Samuel. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, Melinda. Okay, sir. I'm 15 years old. And my question is, if your ex like, in your experience, what is the key to developing a good team? Good, thank you so much. Uh, that's a, a, a great question. You know, a good team, you have to have a mission. And the team has to be you know, fully body to that mission. And what I always say is that when I, when I do an investment, I always start with what are my guiding principles as a team leader. I talk about the force is transparency. There's no hidden agenda. We're all singly focused on a deliverable. So the team has to be, you know, really come together to be able to, you know, you know, accomplish this task. You as a leader have to live it out. Because you have to see that you are, you know, a, a good team player. Now, if there's anyone that is not playing along or, you know, you have to call them out. And it's better to call them out in private as opposed to in public. This is not to shame them. So identifying individuals that can work on the same goals. Um, identifies, you know, it's really, you know, do you all have the same mission? So to me, that's key. And, you know, team can form. Um, in some cases, it's not, you don't go and select your team member. You know, they get, you can be put together. But once you've clearly laid the foundation of what are the expectations, I think the team should be able to work together as, as one. If one or two are not working well together, you know, call, have a discussion with them in, in private. And you know, give them an option to exit the team. If this is what, if they don't believe in the mission of the team. I hope I answered the question here. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Yeah. Please, next question. And Angela, please ask your question. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, Ma. I'm Angela Bodinde. I'm a 14 year old and I'm a world science scholar. Um, I really like to ask what medical technological projects 
has been the most challenging for you so far? I can tell you that. I know that. And I'm still working on it. Um, when a patient has a GI cancer, gastroenterological, gastrointestinal cancer, they have to resect it. They go in, they resect that segment of the bowel that has tumor or cancer, and they join the rest back together. 90%, 99% of the time, everything goes well. But 1% of the time, it's what is called GI leaks. When GI leaks happen, the mortality is over 50%. Wow. when it's not caught in time. I've been working on this project now since 2004. Once I get off this call, we're now engaging with Harvard to bring about 2,000 clinicians together to try to brainstorm on potential solution. So this is an example of and all met me that I and quite a few of us in Jianji we've tried to solve for many years. We've not been successful. Now we're reaching out to the broader Harvard mass general community to try to bring the you know, man, you know, human capacity to see if we can solve it. So that's, to me, honestly, is the biggest healthcare challenge that I've struggled with for the last 16 years. But I believe, I'm confident we'll solve it. Thank you very much, sir. You're welcome. Now, one thing I also that I clearly stated, if you recognize something, we I quickly recognize, I mean, we've struggled with it for many years. We quickly re we recognize that we don't have the capability. Or we may have been trying the same thing. Or there's, you know, a herd mentality. You start thinking the same way. So we're trying to bring fresh new ideas. Leverage the 2000 Harvard MGH clinicians to bring a fresh eye to this problem. You don't have to be the one to solve the problem. You should just know where to go find it. And that's one thing also I was told when I was finishing my PhD. I was scared. And once you have a PhD, people think you know everything. I remember Dr. Fry telling me, you don't have to know everything. You just have to know where to go find it. Find it. Thank you very much, sir. This was also very encouraging. All right, um, Calvin, come please ask your question. Just your name and your age. Um, Kevin Samuel, I'm 17 years old. Um, my question is, my question is, um, share an example of when you established and accomplished a goal that was personally challenging. What you, what helped you succeed? Thank you so much. That's uh, it's, it's, uh, the personal goal that I've, um, you know, every year, I start with every year, my son and I, we always put together our goals and we always, we always ask ourselves, what's our personal challenge goal that we want to achieve? This year, my son and I, actually me, you know, decided I was going to exercise every day. Every day. And um, I looked at that and I said, it's important for my health. So every day, I try to hit the gym for at least one hour or walk for at least one hour. But then that period too, I use that period also to think. Sorry, also to think. So that, you know, so I'm using that so period that, to improve you know, my health, but I'm also using it as an opportunity to, you know, to have a time for myself and to think. And it is not easy, you know, getting up at five o'clock every day. 
to go on the treadmill or to go walk when it was, you know, nice outside. But I've, been, I've benefited significantly from it because I've always had the opportunity to use it to think, but it's also, I've seen the impact on my health. I hope I was able to answer your question. Kevin? Yes, sir. Hello, Kelvin. Thank you. All right. Okay. Thank you. Mr. please ask your question. You can equally type it on the chat box, please. Okay. Good, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Uchechi Marianne. I'm 15 years old. My question is, why did you choose medical technology? Why did I? Good question, actually. You know, I am... It, it, honestly, um, it was was by accident. It wasn't you know? I've always knew that I you know as I said I did a chemistry. I wanted to be you know medical. Uh, I wanted to go to medical school, and I was doing you know codings for Bayer. But when I was looking for a job, and I found this small company, but I thought what the what could the impact be? if I really you know, establish myself in the industry. There's nothing wrong with having a beautiful uh, coatings for cars and automotive and plastics. But I felt that by working for Closure Medical, I'm gonna have an impact on humanity or human healthcare. To me, that's really um, what you know, kept me in this business. Um, I am sure if another company in coding would have hired me, I would probably have joined it. But if I had, looking back, I'm glad I made that decision to join Closure Medical when I joined in 1989. I'm 1998. Because medical technology is what the future is in our, in our lives. I mean, we are constantly, you know, we're, we're, we're all living longer. I want to live healthier. I want to have, great surgical outcomes. And these are only going to happen as a result of medical technologies or medical innovations. So um, it wasn't well planned, but I'm glad um, I stumbled on it. And it's, dr it's driven me since then. Thank you. Sir, please, I also have another question. Go ahead. Okay ask what are the areas of specialization in medical technology and please can you list them out for me absolutely you know you're a smart young woman um 50 year old I, I, you know my son is 16 i wish he's he's at, as articulated as you are so keep up the good work and you know uh, keep up what you're doing so Thank um, you. medical technology is actually quite broad i mean we have um, I focus on many, many areas. I focus on, you know, vision care. You know, the contact lens you wear is a medical technology. I focus on surgery, the suturing, and the access to the body cavity is a medical technology. I focus on orthopedic. You know, repairing the bones is a medical technology. Um, cardiovascular, you know, repairing the heart is a medical technology. Um, Even, um, uh, what do you call it, the beds in the beds that are even in the hospital, you may, you may not think of it like that, are medical technologies. Infusion pumps are medical technology. So medical technology is actually quite broad. Dental, is an, you know, dental application is a medical technology. So, but we focus on few key areas. We focus on vision, soft tissue repair, orthopedic, and cardiovascular. So those are some of the key areas. Then there's a dental, there's, you know, but these are the key areas of medical technologies that we have. And of course, there's a diagnostics aspect of it. You know, when they have the blood work done or urine work done, these are also medical technologies that will analyze what are the metabolites, what are the, you know, components that are, you know, these are also medical technologies that are 
you know, that are you know, crucial for really helping the surgeon or the clinician at the end of the day, repairing us or bringing us back to full or understanding the underlying disease is different from pharmaceutical. You know, in this case, you're not, you know, pharmaceutical, anything pharmaceutical is interacting with the physiology, physi you know, physiological functioning of the body. Medical technologies is holding on to what nature can do, but enabling the nature to do it well. I hope I was able to answer your question, but I'm so, I'm so proud of you, young lady. Thank you. You're Thank going you, uh, Uche, Uche Chimere, so when Angela introduced herself, she said she was a world science scholar. You didn't tell him what she did this year. So you, you also have a special uh, award. Why, why don't you tell him about it? I was able to be part of an international youth deliberation for climate change, where I was able to share my thoughts on issues in Nigeria about climate change. Although we were supposed to travel to Spain, but we were not able to travel due to the COVID-19. But I'll also be able to do other things due, um, concerning climate change. Also, thanks to the Viciola Foundation, the knowledge I got through them also helped me to boost my knowledge on what I was able to experience there. That's awesome. Congratulations and keep up the good work. Uh, you do well, you know, we need scientists you know, focus on climate change and the world, everything is changing around us and we, we need individuals that are really focused on understanding the science so that we, I believe in science. Thank you. So, Serena, you are going to read a question from the chat. Thank you very much, sir for this wonderful. Yes, I was supposed to read a question, but I got disconnected then. It's reconnected again, so the question has actually cleared off. So, Emmanuel, please, can you read the question from your end? Question from Chibuke. Right, so I'll take the question. So he said, I am Chibuke Udonsi. I am 13 years old. My question is, how were you able to cope in the days of not being able to choose the career path your dad wanted? How did you cope with the decision during the day days you were not able to choose the career path? Yeah, uh, good question. You know, we live in a different age right now. I mean, I will not, um, I will guide my son on what career he should consider. If he chooses any other career, what I want for him is to be a fulfilled human being. And, um, and I think that's, at the end of the day, that's what uh, my dad probably was happy with, that he saw me as a fulfilled individual. That, you know, even though I was, you know, I'm not a medical doctor, but he saw how I've been blessed and how I've been able to use the gift that I've been gifted with to impact other people. And to him, I think that is, uh, you know, he, of course, he never told me how it felt, how, you know, but my sense is that's, for him, while it could have been disappointing initially, in the long run, I think he's, he was happy for who I am today. So I wouldn't say, you know, you shouldn't listen to your parents to decide on your career, but you also have to ask yourself, what are you going to excel in? What is really dear to your heart? Because this is what you're going to live with. All right, I would answer for Chibike. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Thank you very much, Dr. Badejo. We are grateful. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for bringing out your time to discuss with us. We are very much happy. And maybe if um, there's any just final words of, of wisdom, um, I think some of these students are surprised to hear that your background might be similar or even you know, more challenging than, than what they're currently facing. But look, look how you've been able to overcome so many obstacles. So 
Um, any final words um, of advice um, to give to them? We really appreciate your time and, and your words of wisdom. No, I mean, I'm humbled for the, for the opportunity to present, but uh, at the end of the day, we have to, um, for me, it's being, you know, having a focus in life and having a passion. Uh, because you're going to have, you're going to have, you know, failure is an option. You know, people say, you know, failure is not an option. I said, that's wrong. Failure is an option. You learn from it. But if you, are, if, you are, if you are very committed and you are passionate about it, when you fail, you learn from it and move on and you develop from it. So my words of advice is, you know, have a goal, you know, have a purpose. And, you know, I'm, you know, I'm just blessed by hearing about, you know, a lot of good questions that are coming from these. Many of the individuals on this call are my son's age. And, I'm, I'm just blown away about your maturity. I mean, I love my son, but I also know that there's a different level of maturity of a lot of younger kids in Nigeria that are very focused than our kids here. So keep up the good work. You are, you're going to do well and just remain focused. There are so many distractions for our young people and we can be easily distracted. But that being said, even we adults can easily be distracted, but you can just focus on what you have, you know, your dreams are. Your dreams are within your reach. And that's what I tell my son. They are within your reach. It's within you. Just go ahead and leave it out. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Badejo. We wish you an amazing weekend and you. you will continue to hear about these students in, in the future. And I'm sure one day we'll, they'll tell the world that, you know, they listened to this career talk and they were inspired and challenged and motivated. So thank you so much again thank for you. your time thank and you. have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.